I want to talk about a strange little moment in the silent classic Phantom of the Opera from 1925. If you've seen the most common version, it opens with a man with a lantern walking through a dark catacomb, presumably beneath the Paris Opera House. He stops and looks at the camera, pausing for an awkwardly long time as if he's speaking. You can barely see his mouth moving, but you obviously can't hear anything because it's a silent film. Then the phantom shadow comes by and the man hides for a moment. Then he comes back out, talks some more, and then the film begins. It drags on for an uncomfortably long time. It's strange that something so pointless and clumsy happens right before a major classic film. It's one of those things you just move past. You know, the rest of the movie's so good it washes your memory clean of that part. Then later, you watch it again and think, oh yeah, what's that about? Who is he? What's he saying? Long ago, I heard a rumor that it was meant for somebody in the theater to provide the voice by reading a script out loud for the audience. Don't remember where I read that, but now it seems there's no evidence to support it whatsoever. No explanation of why this scene is here. Whenever I think of a reason, I learn something else that debunks it and leads me down a long, convoluted road of this movie's mixed-up history. 1925 is the year that's commonly associated with the film, since that's when it was originally released. Though it's worth mentioning, there were three versions of the movie that all came out in 1925, and even more since then. In 25, there was a preview version that showed to a select crowd that apparently tanked so badly they re-edited the film, and also shot new footage. Most notably, the final scene when the Phantom is chased down and killed by an angry mob. This was version number two, which screened at the premiere, but this one also had its complaints. So it was decided to re-edit it even more, still including the mob scene, and that became version number three, which was the general release version, and was a big success. This is also the only version from 25 that still exists, somewhat. The others are lost entirely. Then, in 1929, when sound movies was the new big thing, Universal decided to re-release The Phantom as a sound movie. We could call this version number four. Usually this is referred to as the 1929 version, but people also talk about a 1930 version, but I assume it's the same thing because I believe it came out close to the new year. This version is also lost, but some elements exist. From what we can tell, it was a mix of footage from the silent version and new footage with dialogue. They were able to get most of the same actors to come back to reshoot their scenes, this time recording their voices too. Unfortunately, the Phantom himself, Lon Chaney, wasn't available because he switched contracts to MGM. Plus, they weren't even allowed to dub his voice with another actor, apparently. Maybe it had something to do with the fact he was coming out with a new sound film called The Unholy Three. It was a big deal because it was Chaney's first sound movie, the first time hearing him speak, so they probably didn't want competition or confusion over a different actor dubbing his voice for The Phantom. Also, to complicate things further, he had throat cancer. Unholy Three turned out to be his final film. With the Phantom having to be a silent character in a sound film, they added a new character, the Phantom's servant, to speak for him. This only happens when he's off screen as a shadow, but when the Phantom is on screen, it converts back into a silent movie with title cards. That may seem weird that it's a half silent, half sound film, but that was kind of common as the film industry was making the transition. The most famous example is probably The Jazz Singer. Even though people call it the first sound film, it's mostly just a synchronized musical score with a few dialogue scenes. I imagine Phantom 29 was probably similar to that in a way. We do know there is a substantial amount of dialogue because the sound exists, but it probably had a large emphasis on musical synchronization with the opera performances. Only a small bit of footage exists. So now that I've explained the history of the Phantom and of the lost sound version, I can get back to the man with the lantern. At first it was my guess that this clip came from the sound version. He's clearly supposed to be speaking, but the sound was lost. That would seem like a perfect explanation, even though it's extremely confusing. Essentially, the idea is that what we're seeing is a silent version of the sound version, as if they trimmed the dialogue and added title cards, 
except for that lantern scene. Why would they make a silent version out of the sound version? Perhaps it was made for theaters that weren't yet equipped for sound. But if the movie was already silent to begin with, why couldn't they just use the original? Maybe because the 1925 film prints weren't properly taken care of. Maybe it was in bad shape or temporarily lost. Well, it definitely existed in some form because Universal sold lower quality 16mm prints of it for the consumer market, though most of these are lost or deteriorated. A film preservationist, John Hampton, collected every surviving piece available and compiled a close reconstruction of Phantom 25. The footage differs slightly from the more common version, suggesting that they did in fact come from two different sources. The more common version is always referred to as the 29 version, even on the DVD and Blu-rays. But things don't add up. The sound elements that exist do not sync up with any of the footage, and there's nothing of the man with the lantern. The only thing that syncs up is one of the opera scenes. Also, a reminder, Chaney wasn't available for the reshoots, so everything of him would have had to have come from the silent version. So that brings up the question, what mixed up version of Phantom is this? The answer is exactly that. It's a mix of all kinds of crap. Let's go back to Phantom 25 once again. When they were filming, they wanted to have two negatives, possibly so they could send one copy out to the foreign market. Uh, whatever the reason, the easiest way for them to get two negatives was to film it with two cameras simultaneously. The cameras were right next to each other, so the angles are slightly different. They also sent out different takes. So this existing 1929 version, as it's called, is actually made up of alternate camera angles and alternate takes. This is where it really blows your mind. The famous iconic scene where the Phantom gets unmasked, if you compare the two versions, you'll see it's two different takes. You know how sometimes you watch a film and it's slightly different? You blame it on faulty memory, but really, this time, it's not your memory. You may have actually seen two versions. Also, this common version does use some footage from the 29 sound version, mainly the opening titles and an opera scene or two. But most of the footage was shot in 1925. So in a nutshell, the common version that most people have seen, the version that's on all the VHS tapes thanks to its public domain status, the version with the best image quality that's been restored and touched up over the years to look beautiful, especially on the recent Blu-rays. This version is not Phantom 25 or Phantom 29. It's a mixed up hodgepodge with silent footage, sound footage, different camera angles, different takes, a man with a lantern. This famous, classic, beloved film is not the real film. It's a mess. We're only seeing the scraps of a classic film. But despite all that, it rose to become a classic itself. The common Phantom is more accurately known as the Eastman print because it was printed by the Eastman house in the early 50s. It was from a 35mm source and is in way better condition than the 1925 reconstruction. So it's no wonder why this became the common version. Seems image quality is usually favored over everything else. Which version is actually a better movie is open for debate. I personally prefer the Eastman version because it has a quicker pace. But the actual reason why the Eastman version was made is still shrouded in mystery. Who knows if it was even edited in 29? It could have been the 50s. It seems to me like the man with the lantern would have perfectly fit in tone with 50s audiences. I could imagine him saying something like, Good evening, boys and ghouls. It's like something William Castle would do. This is when theaters were becoming more interactive to compete with television. But there's a little problem. The Lantern Man's on the 1925 version too. <laughs> oh gee. So I don't know. Uh, keep in mind, uh, this 25 version that exists today is just a reconstruction using a compilation of different sources. 
the title sequence is still from the 29 version, so it's possible they took the Lantern Man from that also. The scene is cut way shorter. Nobody knows when the Lantern Man first appeared, but he couldn't have been there in 25. It's clearly meant to be a sound scene, so why did such a faithful film preservationist include that in a reconstruction? To make things even more confusing, there's a closer shot of the Lantern Man, a close-up shot that doesn't appear in any other versions. Where the hell did this come from? How did it get spliced on both existing versions when it has no business being there at all. Sure, it's interesting, but there's no sound to it, so cut it out. But there are some versions that have added sound to it. The 2009 Real Classics DVD has a voice where the man says things like, there are shadows here, this is the lair of the phantom. The voice is credited to John Griggs. I can't find any more information on who he is, but the voice sounds vintage. And if it was recorded more recently, then I can say they did a good job recreating the mood from that time period. My guess is that it was recorded in the 50s or 60s, or any time really, but I doubt it's from 1929. Also, there's a VHS tape where Christopher Lee appears at the Paris Opera House giving an introduction to the film, which has a soundtrack by Rick Wakeman, the keyboardist from Yes, also did some stuff for Sabbath, Ozzy, David Bowie. But anyway, Christopher Lee also provides the voice for the Lantern Man. And if you want anybody doing this voice, it's Christopher Lee. Strangely, it seems to borrow lines from the John Griggs voiceover, mainly the final part where he says, the phantom, the phantom of the opera. Maybe it's a coincidence, or maybe they both borrowed from another source. Did there exist some kind of script? Did anyone actually remember seeing the Lantern Man back when it had sound? Who knows? The Lantern Man's true voice may be lost forever. And I didn't even get into the color scenes. Originally, the masquerade scene was shot in color, and there was also a scene with the Phantom on the roof. His cape was colorized using an ancient hand painting process. For decades, you could only see it in black and white, but somebody eventually found the color masquerade sequence and spliced it into the Eastman print. Next thing, the colored cape appeared on one of the Blu-rays, so this movie's being restored all the time. The Shadowland DVD made a hypothetical sound version by ambitiously dubbing all the dialogue. I even heard a 3D version is being made using both camera sources since the movie was technically shot in 3D, even if it was accidental 3D. <laughs> the history of this movie is so confusing, and we're always learning new things about it. And as for the man with the lantern, nobody has a fucking clue.